Welcome back, everybody. I know you guys are here because you're so excited to learn more about Hebrews. So we're just going to go ahead and cut to the chase. Last time we talked about Hebrews chapter 9. So I bet you can never guess which one we're going to cover today. Chapter 11, that's right. Wait, no. It's actually chapter 10 because 10 comes after 9. Got it. All right. So just like the rest of this book of Hebrews, the author is making his case for Christ being the Messiah, the great high priest, that there's a whole new covenant for them to live by. That the old covenant had flaws in it, and the new covenant does not have flaws in it. So that's where he starts out. Chapter 10, verse 1. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So he's just reminding them, you know, going back to chapter 9, how the Old Covenant could not make perfect the conscience of the worshippers. And he's just reiterating that point here. And then um, every year he's just referring back to the sacrifices that were being made, the Old Covenant, how every year they had to continually make sacrifice after sacrifice, and that it was never enough. And so that's the flaw in it. If there was a covenant to where it would be once and for all, kind of like what Jesus did, that's the perfect covenant. If the old covenant was worth while, if it was worth doing, then we would no longer have to continually offer sacrifices. And so that's what he's trying to make the case for. We'll continue on. You guys, we've already covered that a little bit. A lot of it, actually. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. So those are quotes from the book of Psalms. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So basically, he's letting them know like that old covenant did not work. It was not good enough. He never, God never wanted the sacrifices of the lambs and the bulls. It was just a reflection of what needed to happen. The, the representation of the blood that needed to be shed because of our sin. The consequence of our sin. Um, it says that he did not desire or take pleasure in the sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings. Um, and when Jesus came, he does away with that, which he's already said a couple times before. So we're going to keep on moving on. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. There's a couple things right here that I want to point out to you guys. First off, it gives a description of what the priests do. Daily they're standing, they're working, they're offering sacrifices. That's the picture you get of the priests, that they're working. Okay. What is the picture that it shows of Jesus? It shows that he's sitting at the right hand of God. So you got people over here working... Then you got Jesus sitting down, okay? I mean, there's a big difference there. Jesus sitting down means that there's no more work to be done. These priests were continually working, and every year they'd have to make more sacrifices and more and more and more, and it was just never enough. It was a never-ending cycle. But when Jesus comes with his covenant, it's completely different. There's no more work to be done by anybody. He's already done literally all the work. There's nothing else for you to do. He's already done it all. And so he's sitting down. He's like, I'm done. I'm resting. I'm chilling. I'm good. Nothing else for us to do. Jesus has completely finished everything that needs to happen for us to be saved and for our sins to be forgiven. That's point number one I see here. But point number two that I see is right here. It says that he is waiting for the time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. So think about the Old Testament, the Jewish people, they're believing that there's one day going to be a Messiah, somebody who's going to come, take care of business, defeat their enemies, 
and make everything back to where it's supposed to be. So they're looking for this Messiah from the line of David, but ultimately from Eve. Because in Genesis 3, after right before we get kicked out of the garden, right after they sin, Jesus comes in and he's handing out the curses for man and woman and Satan. And when he's talking to Satan, he gives Satan the statement. Um, I don't want to misquote it, so I'm going to go back. If you're with me, it's Genesis chapter 3. Got to get there first. Sorry, guys. Okay. And it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. There's going to be one to come that's going to crush Satan underneath his feet. And it says here, Jesus is that one that's going to be making them a footstool for his feet. Um, and so he's giving another option. So like Jesus is high priest. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than all these other things. And now he's saying he's also the one that they talked about putting his enemies under his feet as a footstool. So he's just making another case like, hey, Jesus is this dude. He is who you have been looking for. There's no more need for you to look. All the covenants, all the promises, they've already been fulfilled. Jesus is who you need to be worshiping. Jesus is who you follow. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. There's no more need for sin or for offering sacrifices for sins. We've talked about that over and over again. Here he switches it up a little bit. So if you guys think we're just repeating ourselves, we're going to switch it up just a little bit, okay? Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. This is awesome. So you guys remember the idea of the high priest and how the high priest would enter into the veil, um, would come behind the veil, enter into the holy place, right? Regular people couldn't do that. If you weren't from the line of Levi, you were not going into that tabernacle. You were not going behind that curtain, okay? Now he's saying that you guys can have confidence, all of us, to go in there. And when you think about the high priest, we talked about this before, the most high, or Jesus is the most high priest, the high priest who would enter. Man, there had to be a sense of, of fear going in there because there were people who went in there and died because they didn't offer a sacrifice right or they went in there wrong. And so we don't have to be fearful when we come to God. We can have confidence, assurance that when we go to God, he's going to accept us and love us because, not because of us, it says we can enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So only through Jesus. It's not anything we did. It's all Jesus, right? And it's the new way that he opened for us through the curtain. That is through his flesh. Man, that's awesome, right? And so our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. We are perfect. When God looks at us, so think about the old covenant. When the high priest would go in there and sprinkle blood everywhere, everything would be made perfect. It would be atoned for for that year. Okay, so when we go face Jesus, when we come to the throne of God, when we look, at, come and, and try to meet Him, right? When we come into His presence, He looks at us and He sees holy, right? The whole purpose of the Bible and our, you know, our faith is because we know we're sinners. God is holy; we are not, and so He can only be in the presence of holiness. We're not holy, so we can't be in His presence. So we're apart from Him. So how do we get back to him? And that's the whole having a priest in between to mediate for us. We've talked about all that, okay? When we come to God, we know that he sees us as perfect. And he, we can have confidence that he sees us as holy, righteous. And we're able to talk to him. Knowing that we are sinners, we're not perfect. How is that even possible? Well, when God looks at us, he doesn't see us. He doesn't see our sin. He looks at us and sees the blood of Jesus, his son. The perfect one. Jesus' blood is sprinkled on us. It's covering us. 
So when he sees us, he sees his son. So when he sees his son, he's like, come to me. You know, isn't that cool that we can go to God with full assurance? We don't have to be scared. Now, we have a healthy fear. We've talked about the fear. But we can have full assurance that we can go to God and that his promises are true. Man, yeah. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. God never fails. He is faithful. We can trust everything he's ever said. We can trust that we are his. Because it says that once we're in his hand, nobody can ever be plucked from his hand. He's the one in control. So if we're his, we're his. And you can have full assurance of that. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay, just real quick. I know we're going a little. I'm trying to make this video as quick as possible. <laughs> but guys, this right here, y'all already know where I'm going with it. Okay, it says, do not neglect to meet together. All right? How many of you guys have done that? Have made a habit of not meeting together? Man, it's so easy. What happens is, is you know, first off, it was COVID, right? We have that excuse. It's a legit excuse we missed because of COVID. Well, then it's, all right, well, I can just watch online every week until things get back to normal. Cool, that's fine. Some people do that. It's all good. We're still, we're still rocking with it. But then... It's like, oh, you know what? That video is going to be up. I can watch it later. I don't have to be there on time for church. I can just watch it later. It's no big deal. Now we're starting to stretch that line a little bit, right? And then you oversleep. You don't watch. You forget about it. You don't watch the video. You don't join in the church. And now you're in a habit of not meeting together with us. So the point I want to make here is that if you have created that habit, let's get you out of it. Okay? Come hang out with us tomorrow. Or Sunday, whenever you're watching this video, come hang out with us on Sunday. And we're going to be going through Hebrews chapter 11. Come hang out with us, whether it's in person or online. We're going to have an online option. So go ahead and join on Zoom with us if that's what you want to do. But here's the deal. We've made an excuse of, oh, well, we're not meeting in person, so I'm not going to come. Guys, we have a good number of people that come in on Wednesdays. But then the last two Wednesdays, you know how many people we had on our Zoom call? We had two the first week, two, and then we had five the next time, when we normally have like 20 or, or more. That's an issue, right? Now, I'm not going to go deep into that, but if I know Zoom is not fun, I know that online is not fun, you guys do it for eight hours a day for school, and I know you don't want to sit there for another hour and a half doing it, but... If God is a priority, if the church is a priority like it should be, and that's how we are choosing to meet right now because of whatever the circumstances are, then whatever, however the church decides to meet, you got to be there. If you're not there, we're missing a piece. So like when we look at the Bible and the scriptures, it tells us that the body of Christ, the church, my bad, the church is like a body of Christ. Okay, so when you look at the church, we are a body. And so if one of you is missing... Shoot, we could be missing a finger. We could be missing a toe, a nose, a nostril. We don't want to miss our nostril, okay? We want to be able to breathe. We need you guys there, and you guys need us. We need to be able to be there to build each other up and to encourage each other, equip each other all the more, all right? I know that it's not a whole lot of fun online, so, but that's not an excuse. We've got to be there together, okay? All right, let's try to finish this up real quick. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Okay, this is really, I'm not trying to scare you guys, but this is what the Bible says. Like, I'm just reading it, okay? It says, if we keep sinning deliberately, you know the truth. You know what sin is. You know what sin is in your life that you continually do over and over again. You know it's sin, but you continue to do it. Deliberately, on purpose. After receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Amen. You know what's wrong, and you're still going to do it anyways. And you're purposefully sinning. Going against God, on purpose. 
And that means you're purposefully choosing to be an enemy of God. So his sacrifice for your sins does not apply to you. That's a heart problem. That's a heart issue that needs to be changed. If you're doing that, this is the expectation it says you should have. You should expect judgment and the fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. We've gone over this. There's either heaven or hell when you die. You're either going to face God and he's going to say, come live with me forever. You're going to be in a relationship with him forever. Or you're going to be apart from him facing his wrath forever. There is no in between. And so that's what you should expect if you are deliberately sinning, if you are not in God's hand. Okay. And this next little part, he's going to give an example. And then you, based off of that example, continue on in this teaching. Okay. So these guys know the Old Testament law. And based off the Old Testament law, let's say you kill somebody and there's uh, and you go to court over it. You know, somebody they're trying to decide whether you did it or not and what your judgment is going to be. What they would do is they, if you had evidence based off of two or three or more witnesses, then you could be judged. And you had to have at least two witnesses for this to come about. OK, so with that in mind, here we go. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Based off the law of Moses, you can die without mercy based off of the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay, How much worse punishment do you think will be de deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? Outrage the spirit of grace. Wow. That's something to think about when you sin. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. I have that whole little spot in a box, circled, underlined, highlighted. That's huge, right? God has said, Vengeance is mine. He's going to repay. And we're going to get what we deserve, okay? The Lord is going to judge us one day. It says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. If you're not on his side, if you're not his, it's something you should be scared about. So I'm going to go ahead and finish up just real quick. He gets done giving them this grim reality, this truth that without God, it does not end well at all for you. But he doesn't leave them there. So I want you guys to see. He tells them this grim reality, then he builds them up. Remember earlier, he says that when we meet together, we encourage one another. So he encourages them and points to them and shows them some of the fruits, some of the good things of them that he has seen through them. It's not all bad. He says, but recall the former days when, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. It didn't matter what they did, what sufferings they, that came their way. They knew that what they had in Jesus was never going to leave. Their joy could never be taken from them. That they had this hope to cling to no matter what. And I want you guys to know that in, in the midst of COVID, uh, all the things going on in the world, literally everything, you guys can trust and hope in Jesus and know that your joy cannot be taken away. Um, there's nothing that this world has to offer that is going to give you a full satisfaction the way that Jesus does. Everything else is going to want you, it's going to leave you wanting more. You're never going to be satisfied. You will never be satisfied outside of Jesus. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I pray that each and every one of you's faith is not one that shrinks back and is destroyed, but that you have faith and it perseveres and that it's preserved till the end. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about, or today, whenever y'all are watching this video, we're going to be talking about Hebrews chapter 11. Don't miss it. Come hang out with us. Come fellowship with us. I'm looking forward to it, and I'll see y'all there.